Today I want to talk to you all about confessional Christianity. So if you have a Bible, would you turn to John 10, verses 9 through 10. And it says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And the title of today's message is a la carte. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. And we just thank you that you're here, that you're present, that you're moving. Lord, we pray that your word would go forth. Lord, we pray that lives would be changed. Lord, we pray that revelations would be had today in this room. And Lord, we thank you that you are good and that you're with us. And it's in your mighty, mighty name we pray. And all of Coast Life Church said... And all of Coast Life Church said, amen. amen, amen. Well, my husband is Dylan, and we have four kids. We have four boys, okay? They're eight, six, three, I think, and then he is three. I'm just kidding. And our youngest is 10 months, and life is wild with four boys. My son the other day literally shot a Nerf gun into his eyeball, like this close. He's fine. He recovered. Um, but one of the things that we've done in the past is we've gone to a buffet. I'm also Hispanic, so everything in me is fighting to not say buffet, because that's how I would say it. So if, I, if you hear that, it's the same thing, okay? Um, so I don't know why, like a buffet always sounds like a good idea. I have never left a buffet and being like, that was a great idea. <laughs> I've never. So we go with our four kids and you know, when you go to a buffet, you got to get like a bigger table because you're going to have like one of each. So we're, we're mentally preparing for the chaos that's about to happen. We're looking at each other and I'm like, okay, babe, I'm going to hold the kids down. You go, you make the first round, grab all of this, grab this. Then the kids start hearing me shouting what we're going to eat. And they're like, don't forget the donuts and the ice cream. And dad, can you get some fries and a cheeseburger without the cheese? And you know what? The pizza with the pepperoni, but also without the pepperoni. So Dylan's got this whole list. He makes the first round. He comes back and the table is filled. We've got like three half-eaten cookies, four things of ice cream that have melted. The, ketchup, the fries, you don't even see them because they're drowning in the ketchup. Somehow the pizza is also drowning in the ketchup because they're kids. Then there's like that one plate of like your fruit and veggies. You know, you're just so hopeful. You're like, yeah, they're going to, one of them will eat that. And then there's always like that random piece of seafood, which I don't know why, why do they serve seafood at a buffet? Like that should be illegal. But there's always somehow that random piece that's on the table. And what I've come to realize is my kids actually never leave a buffet feeling filled. They have filled their tummies with sugar, with sweet, but with no sustenance. And I know this for a fact because the minute we get home, my children are all asking me for a snack after we have left the buffet. And I think in our world today, this can be a challenge that we face as Christians as well. We can be inclined or even tempted to pick and choose what we want from scripture, what we want to apply to our lives, what we want to believe. But in the end, what ends up happening is we're not getting the full meal. We aren't getting filled because we aren't getting all the nutrients that we need. And the scripture I just read, John 10.10, 10, it's a verse that has been used to describe a Christian life time and time and time again. And I love that Jesus' desire for us is not just to live, it's not just to cope with our circumstances and exist, but he came so that we would have life and life more abundantly. And I think we can read this scripture and it's like so hopeful, it's so inspiring. If you had MySpace, like if I had MySpace now, that would probably be in my bio, like, yay, go Jesus, right? But I think if we're being honest, maybe there's many of us that are sitting here, and even though we're walking with God, even though we're saved, we may be sitting here not feeling like we're living a life of abundance. And it's not because Jesus isn't willing or able. We aren't living God's best because we are willing to settle for less. And you see the word abundant in Greek is parison. I have no idea if that's how you pronounce it, guys. I speak two languages, okay? Um, and it means to exceed a number, measure, rank, or need. 
What it represents is over and above, more than necessary, and our opportunity to live an abundant life begins the moment we receive Christ. We have the option to step into that. But now I think our idea of abundant has to be clarified because if our interpretation of abundant doesn't go beyond fine dining, designer clothes, a luxury car, then we're missing his point. And I think if we were even to take it a step further and we start thinking about perfect health, your dream spouse, your dream job, fame, are all of the things that we would think that are going to fulfill that need, we would still fall short of the meaning of abundant that Jesus is trying to explain here. Because you see, an abundant life is a life that is complete. Everybody say complete. It's full of good things, and it's not dependent on our external circumstances. And it's given by God to those who seek it. You see, it's a life that is not necessarily one of comfort and ease. It doesn't mean an abundance of material things, but instead it's characterized by spiritual and mental abundance, and it's a life that is filled with purpose. But now part of living a life of abundance is actually being committed to continuously living a life as a Christian the way the Bible instructs us. Because I think we can get into this habit where we get saved and we think everything is going to change overnight. Where we get saved and we're wondering why we're still dealing with the same things. But part of getting saved is that it's a walk with Christ, right? And those are the steps that we need to take. And in John 10.10 it says, I came so that they may have. This is talking about potential, it's talking about possibilities, it's talking about what is available. We always have a choice. We have free will to make decisions about our lives, so why would we want to settle for anything less than God's best? So today, I want to talk about confessional Christianity. And confessional Christianity simply means we take God at his word. It means we stick with the doctrines that the church has confessed regardless of what the current generation has done with scripture. It's really an understanding of what makes Christianity Christian. And now over the ages, throughout history, Christians have differed on what the Bible says and what the Bible teaches and how to interpret the Bible. So the church, they came together because they saw a need for having clear doctrinal summary statements. And this began really in the early church, okay? They continued and it continued through the development of the belief statement that all true churches confess today. And those statements are called the Apostles' Creed. And what that is, it's actually a summary of what the church teaches and of what Christians together believe. These are the foundation of Christianity. And like Pastor Trevor said in week one, these are our non-negotiables, okay? This is not, eh, maybe I believe half of that, eh, I don't know. Did he really rise? Did he do that? I don't know. So the Apostles' Creed, this is what we believe. We believe that God is the creator of the universe. We believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. We believe that he was crucified, that he died and resurrected. We believe that he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the church and the communion of saints. We believe in the forgiveness of sins. And we believe in everlasting life. And Romans 10.10 10 says, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And to confess means to declare. So as Christians, it's important that we declare the truth. But it's also important that our lives are a living confession of who Jesus is. You see, as Christians, what we do and who we are is just as important as what we say and what we believe. And Christianity is a lot of things. But one of the things that it is not, it is not a la carte. And this term basically means that you order items separately. You're not getting the full meal. You don't get the bundle package. And as Christians, we don't get to pick and choose what parts of the Bible we like or what parts of the Bible we do or don't want to apply to our lives. What we're not saying is, hey, I'll take the Ten Commandments. Can you hold the adultery, the lying, and the coveting? 
No, what we're saying is we want the whole meal. Living a life of a confessional Christian is choosing every day to follow Jesus and follow his commands. We take the words Jesus said, we believe them, we receive them, and we eat the whole meal. As Christians, we eat everything that Jesus serves on the table. So today, my heart is that we would be reminded that the greatest title, the greatest role that we will carry is that of being a Christian. It's not a term that we use on occasion. It's not an identity that we only carry on a Sunday, but it's actually who we are every day of our lives. And like I said, I'm a mom of four boys, and I love the title mom. But what good does it do if I don't lead my kids to Jesus? I'm a wife, and I love the title wife, but what good does it do if I don't help my husband walk in God's path? And I'm a friend to many, and I love the title friend, but what good does it do if they're all still living in brokenness and in bondage? You see, our new life begins when we get saved, but it's our confession that keeps us on the journey to abundant life. So today, I want to remind us of what it means to live an abundant Christian life. And the first reminder is that the Bible is our connection. In order for us to battle for the Bible, we have to believe the Bible. And 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. As confessional Christians, we believe the Bible is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And what Timothy is saying in this scripture, he's saying that, all scripture is breathed out by God, that he is the author of the scripture. God is reliable. He created the universe. Therefore, the scripture is reliable. And my son, Killian, he's in the room. He's six years old. Um, he's claimed the title of our backseat driver like the minute he could talk. Like that is the role he plays in our family. One time I hit a curb and he was like, who gave you your license, mom? like, how did you get that? I was like, what are you talking about? The cur was too far out. But every time we get in the car, he starts asking me all these questions. He's like, all right, mom, where are we going? Is it 90 minutes away? I don't know why everything is 90 minutes to a six-year-old. I'm like, you mean an hour and a half? He goes, 90 minutes. And then he starts asking me, well, what way are we going to go? Are we going to go on the highway? He doesn't like going on the highway. He thinks it's further doesn't know the highway actually helps get you there quicker. So he starts asking me all these questions and then we start driving and he proceeds to tell us we are going the wrong way when we are in fact going the right way. And you see, Killian is a lot of things. One, he's an athlete. That boy is starting football in like two weekends and he's pumped, all right? He's smart, he's kind, he's sweet, he's tender, but you know what he's not? He's not reliable, y'all. He's been on this earth for like six years and four months, okay? He just learned how to read. He barely knows how to tell time. He's learning, though, props to him. And if I was to drop him off at the end of our street, I cannot promise you he would know how to get home. And I think that's actually what may happen to, men, to us many times. We're saying, Jesus, take the wheel, but then we become backseat drivers, we have the Bible, we believe the Bible, but if we're honest, we may be questioning the Bible. And I wanna note, there is a difference between asking a question and questioning. And the Bible tells us, do not lean on our own understanding. And I have found myself in this exact position where I'm reading a scripture and it can be challenging, it can be convicting. And for like a split second, I'm like, it's wrong. The Bible's wrong, lays. You're right, and I have to be reminded that God is the author, that he is the originator, that he is the one who created the earth, and why would I challenge or question what the scripture says when I know who God is? And now from the beginning to the end, the Bible, it's a book about God, y'all. It is not a book about us. It tells us about us, it tells us how we should be, what we should do, but it does so through the lens of who God is. 
And the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self go hand in hand. And the goal is to have God's word impact every aspect of our lives so that we might accomplish the purpose for which we are designed for, so that we can step into the abundant life that God has for us. You see, the Bible is our guide to an abundant life. The Bible allows us to follow Jesus, not our idea of Jesus. So as confessional Christians, we read the Bible, we believe the Bible, and we confess the Bible. And now the second reminder is that faithfulness is our calling. You see, the Bible is full of accounts of God's faithfulness. He saved the Israelites from the Egyptians he opened Sarah's room at an old age. He delivered David in battle. And God's faithfulness was actually never more evident than when he went and died on the cross for you and me so that we can have eternal life. But you see, the Bible also says that we are also supposed to be faithful to God. Because to be a Christian is to be called to a life of faithfulness. And one of the key distinctions between a Christian and the world should be our faithfulness. When times get hard, in the midst of our struggles, we are called to not waver and stand firm. We must grasp our faith and hold tight to God's promises. But I think faithfulness is so much more than many realize. You see, it's not just about trusting in God when things are hard, but being faithful means that we obey what God says and we obey every bit of it. And Psalm 92, 13 through 14 said, they are says, they are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are, never full, they are ever full of sap and green. Do you know what being faithful looks like? It looks like being planted in God's house. Because the psalmist in the scripture, what he does, he paints a beautiful picture of what the, the life of the righteous can be if they're planted in the right environment. We need to be planted where we will be fed, where we're going to discover our purpose, where we can stand strong against the storms of life, where we can prosper. And being planted looks like serving. Being planted looks like gathering to participate in corporate worship. Being planted looks like someone who is pouring into others the gifts that the Lord has given them. Being planted looks like being discipled and discipling others. And John 15, 2 says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. So being planted also looks like being pruned. And pruning, it's actually just a selective removal of plant parts, and they do this so that they can give an opportunity for new growth, but also to maintain the overall growth of the plant. And it's actually God who does the pruning, but he does it through his church and his people. And as Christians, we need to get pruned. And you see what happens is you get planted and you join a group and then the branch of addiction begins to get cut off. What happens is you start serving and then your character starts to get developed and the branch of pride, of greed, of lust begins to get cut off. What happens is you start taking your next step and you're gonna get in the waters of baptism and the branch of shame begins to get cut off. Or maybe you join a marriage group and the branch of divorce begins to get cut off. You see, being planted, what that means is we don't leave when we get offended. We don't leave when the church isn't aligned with our preferences. We don't leave when we are upset. And while those feelings may be valid, we are called to a life of faithfulness. The Bible talks on and on and on about restoration. It doesn't say get up and go. It doesn't say leave. And one of the greatest weapons that the enemy is using against us is our lack of accountability. And the church is the place where we can get called higher, where we can have honest controversy, and where we can have hard conversations. So you know ultimately what being planted looks like? It looks like flourishing. It looks like stepping into abundant life. It allows us to bear fruit at every stage of life. The scripture says we are ever full of sap and green. The Lord brings about our vitality even as we age because we plant ourselves in him and in his house. It's connection to God's house, not production, that leads to a fruitful life. 
What will your fruit say about you? And I don't know about you, but the church saved my life. It saved my marriage. It allowed me to discover who I was through who God made me to be. The lives of my children are going to look different because they get to be raised in church. They come on Sundays and they hear the word of God. And when my time here is up, I want to be found faithful. I want to have lived a life that was given to me for God and his glory and not for myself. I want to bear the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Who wants to be found faithful? Can we stay planted? Can we get pruned? Can we flourish in God's house so that we can live a life of abundance? And the third reminder is spreading the gospel is our command. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 said, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. And this is known as the Great Commission. And Jesus, he gave this command to the apostles shortly before he ascended into heaven. These were his final words. And what he said was, go tell and teach others about me. And to this point, I actually never thought about what my final words would be. Um, but if you know me, it would probably be something like, hey, this outfit was on clearance, or you're welcome for being the funniest person in the room. But what this scripture does is it outlines what Jesus expected the apostles to do. But it wasn't just for the apostles. It was for every person who follows Jesus. This is what we as Christians are commanded to do. You know, his final words weren't like, hey, ladies, I know you got four kids and it's a busy busy schedule, especially with Killian starting football now, you know, do you think maybe two months from now you can pencil me in to go and make disciples? This wasn't the great suggestion. This was the great commission. And I want to put it this way. The final things that Jesus said, he said, go out and tell them about me. Tell them what I did. Tell them what you saw. Tell them how I saved Tell them how I healed. Tell them I set free. Tell them how I changed your life. You know what he's saying? He's saying, go out into the world and confess your faith. And we do that through the way that we live our lives and the words we say. And do you know why we share our faith? Because we have what the world needs. We have hope. We have the good news. Come on, how many of you have been witnesses of God's faithfulness, of God's goodness? And we are called to go. In the scripture, he said, go into the world. He didn't say, wait for the world. Our confession should be evident no matter where we're at, if it's in our homes, in our schools, in, in our workplaces. Before we were ever a parent, a child, a student, an employee, we are first a Christian. And in a world that wants to put so many labels on us, the label that I want to be known for is for being a Christian. I am not ashamed. The Lord saved my life. The Lord healed me. The Lord did what only he could do. And I want to tell everybody because we have what the world needs. And you know, Dylan and I, I know we look like we've been saved our whole lives, but we haven't. Uh, seven years ago, we had made the decision that we knew we had to go to church. Um, and the reason why we decided was because my sister, her life started confessing who God was. They got planted and they were literally stepping into the abundant life right in front of our eyes. The way that they were living, the way that they were changing, they were declaring God's goodness and his faithfulness was all over it. And Dylan and I, we knew that we needed more for our lives, that we couldn't stay where we were. And at that time, we had Caden, my oldest, and we were pregnant with Killian. So only two. We're at four now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and I remember we were, we had gone to their church, and then we knew we were like, hey, we need to find a church. We need to get planted. And when we decided that, we were Googling. We were on Instagram. We were looking everywhere. We were willing to drive wherever it was 
to find a church that we knew we were gonna call home. And Coastline Church never came up. It wasn't on Google. It wasn't like top 40 churches in the Northport Venice area. It wasn't on Instagram. Like that was never an option, but we knew we could not wait. We knew that we needed to change our lives. And we had decided in that moment, we were like, hey, well, we'll start going with your parents to their, to their church. And we started going, we were about a month in and Dylan is at the dentist, he's getting a cleaning and the dental hygienist is like having a full conversation. Why do you guys do that? Like, why do you talk with all these tools expecting him to respond? So he's getting his teeth clean and she's like, hey, you know, do you go to church? And he's like, yeah, we've been going here with my parents and that was kind of it. Then that same day later, he's driving and there's a homeless lady on the side of the road and she gets his attention and he's thinking that she's gonna ask for money. Um, and she looks at him and she goes, hey, do you go to church? This is the second person Dylan calls me and he's like, babe, you're never gonna believe this. Two people have asked me today if I go to church. And he goes, I must have a church glow or something. I'm like, baby, that's the sin that you're sweating out. It's only been a month. And then he goes, he goes to the bank and the teller, she goes, do you go to church? And he goes, you know, that's so weird. You're the third person to tell me that today. She goes, you should check out Coast Life Church. It's a church in Venice, Florida, and it's filled with families. He calls me, he's like, babe, I found it. We hadn't even, go we didn't even, honestly, it could have been a trap, babe. We could have gotten killed. But we were just like, we're going, that's it. We are going, we Googled it, we found it on Instagram, and now it came up all over the internet. And we just knew, we knew that that was gonna be our home. And we pulled up to the old location on Seaboard. The road wasn't even paved yet. We got our two kids in tow at this point. Killian was just born and someone pulls up in a golf car and they go, we've been waiting for you. We get in, we sit service, and we just knew that that was home. And then God began to do a work in us because we said yes to everything. We said yes to the Connect card. We said yes to starting point. We said yes to getting in a group. We said yes to serving. We said yes to leading. We said yes to getting planted. And our lives have been forever changed because one person didn't hide their faith, but they confessed it. And to this day, we've never seen that person. And we barely missed a weekend, but I can't help but think, how many people do we still have to confess our faith to? Come on, till Venice looks like heaven, we aren't done. We've got to share the good news. We've got to tell people what the Lord has done. Our lives are a living declaration. We can't take anything to heaven except people. Who are we getting into heaven? Who need to know Jesus? Whose lives need to be changed? Come on, can we be confessional Christians? Can our lives be the proof of what God has done? And you can stand, stay seated. You see, it's continuous confession that saved me, but it's what continues saving me. It's what leads us to an abundant life. And the other day, I read that the average lifespan of a woman in the US is about 80 years old. That of a man is about 73, I believe it. Men be doing reckless stuff. But I want you guys to think of something really quick. I want you to think of your age, and I want you to subtract it from 80 if you're a woman, and from 73 if you're a man. And then I want you to multiply that by 365. Simple math, simple math. But what I want you guys to think about if God allows you to live for the average number of years, how many days do you have left? More importantly, what will you do with those days? I don't wanna wait to get to heaven to step into the abundant life that God has for me. I don't wanna wait to get to heaven to see all of the things I could have had faith for. I don't wanna live a life filled with shame, with bitterness. I don't wanna live a life in bondage and brokenness. I don't wanna live a life where Jesus is at, isn't at the center, where Jesus isn't glorified. And I think some of us are in the room today and we're saved and we're walking with Christ, but there's a lack, there's a void, there's a scarcity or an in inadequacy. But today I wanna to encourage you, cause 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 says, 
That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things we cannot see. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever and this is what it means to be a confessional Christian it means that we believe and we know how the story ends and in the end he wins in the end we're victorious in the end every knee will bow every tongue will confess the earth will be redeemed the earth will be restored healing will flee in the end we win so we don't give up we don't lose heart, we persevere, and that's what's on the menu. That's what Jesus is serving. And an abundant life is not just for eternity, but it's for today. And I think we may also have some people who are in the room and maybe you feel like you don't even have a seat at the table. If you're sitting, would you stand to your feet? Maybe you're in your room and you're like, you know, Lays, I understand what Jesus is serving, but I'm not even invited. I don't have a space. In the scripture that we read earlier, John 10, 9, Jesus makes it very clear. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the way to eternal life. Jesus is the way to abundant life. The pasture is a promise from salvation. The pastor signifies plenty. And if you're in the room today and you've never made Jesus the Lord and leader of your life, I want to tell you that he is waiting, that he is at the door, that he's got a seat for you at the table, that at the other side of that decision, he's got a life that's filled with peace, with love, with joy, with kindness. He has a life that is filled with plenty. He has a life of abundance. So we're going to say a simple prayer. And we're going to say this together as a church, but I know that there's some people who are going to be praying this from their heart today. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, would you repeat after me? If, you, if you're looking to make Jesus the leader and Lord of your life, this is for you. You've got a seat. Jesus is waiting. He's at the door. Repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my past. Wash away my sins. Make me a new person. Today, I choose to follow you. To make you the leader and Lord of my life. And I will never be the same. Come on, and I will never be the same. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Come on, come on, and everybody said? On the other side of that decision, God has more for you. Lack, we're telling you to flee. Come on, there is an abundant life that is waiting for you. And in a world that wants to tell you who you are, in this place, we are going to confess who we are and who made us. So if you made that decision today, I'm going to count to three. Y'all, we're about to have a party. We're going to celebrate because we know that the family just got bigger. So if that was you, unapologetically, unashamed, you're going to lift that hand if you made that decision. On the count of three, one. Come on, if that was you, two, three. 